20s. They didn't like the term Gaelic for whatever reason. They called everything Irish. So in Ireland, they called the language Irish, even though here many people might call it Gaelic. It is a variety of Gaelic, of course. Um, and my friends in Scotland, certainly when I was there studying, some of them <coughs> considered uh, the Irish to be a bit of a sort of what they might call Gaelic imperialists. They called they appropriated everything Gaelic and called it Irish. So, for example, tales of Cuchulain and Finn McCool, which are common to both Gaels in Ireland and Scotland. It's a common shared cultural heritage. And I don't call that Irish mythology. But the older forms of the language, because just like Latin turned into French in France and Italian and Italy and so on, there was one old Gaelic language which became Irish Gaelic in Ireland and Scottish Gaelic in Scotland. In Scotland, they call it Old Gaelic or Old Gaelic. In Ireland, they call it Old Irish. <laughs> <laughs> the most widely used names today there, in Ireland, they call their variant of the language Irish. In Scotland, they call it simply Gaelic or Gaelic. They don't need to specify what kind because it's the only kind they've got. Here, outside the countries, I find it often necessary to distinguish. I'll often say Irish Gaelic or Scottish Gaelic so people know which one I'm talking about. But see, you will find encounter strong opinions about names. <laughs> First attested in the fourth century BC, inscriptions in a script called Ogham that some of you might have heard of, carved in rocks, usually names. So and so carved this. This belongs to so and so. That type of thing. That was a period that they called primitive Irish or primitive Gaelic. Very little of it left apart from some names and things in these carvings. The old Gaelic period started around 600 A.D. I mean, we'll skip the whole kind of different periods because we're kind of short on time now. Um, but really, the literary attestations for Gaelic begin around the six, 600 or so. Um, culminating in the, between 1200 A.D. and mid-18th century in an <coughs> elevated literary language called Classical Gaelic in Scotland, Classical Irish in Ireland, which was the language of the bards traveling poets, there was an educated artistic class who sang the praises of their chiefs and so on. Um, by the mid-17th century, this, the cultural institutions that supported this had broken down. And at that point, there ceased to be a unified literary um, register of the language, and that's when we see the emergence of what we consider today modern Irish, modern Scottish Gaelic, modern Manx. Um, Ireland was majority Gaelic speaking until around 1800, at which point it became a minority language and was decimated in the 1800s, especially due to the Great Famine, during which time a million people died, another million emigrated, almost all of them Gaelic speakers. Irish is recognized by the Constitution of Ireland as of <coughs> 1922 as the first official language. So it has official status, but this is mostly symbolic. Names of government bodies and institutions have Gaelic names, but most people don't actually speak it in their daily life. It is a mandatory subject studied in all public schools, at least, not necessarily private schools. It's required for some jobs. The National University of Ireland, you have to pass a certain, they have a certain proficiency level exam in Irish in order to get into study. Uh, so a lot of people in Ireland have some exposure to the language, even though they don't really speak it. Native speakers are still declining, even though you look at the census and you say, wow, a million and a half, 1.7 million people speak Irish. As I said, the number of native speakers is at most 70, 80,000 and dropping. Because the native speaking regions are what they call the Gaeltachti, which are in the north, west, and south, the very, very fringes of land next to the Atlantic. They're very poor, rural. They're romanticized by generations as the true Ireland, you know, the thatch-roofed huts with the peat fires and all of that, but no jobs, and people left to actually try to earn a better life elsewhere, and in doing so often ended up switching to English. A Gaelic speaker might marry an English speaker, and then the language of the family from then on would be English. There is a growing number of speakers, these second language speakers, in urban environments, mostly due to a network of Irish Gaelic medium schools. Um, as of 2007, it is an official language of the European Union. Uh, so that's the status of Irish. Scottish Gaelic, the number of speakers under age 20 is steadily growing. 
but not enough to stem the tide. The total number of speakers keeps dropping because so many of them are elderly, 70, 80, 90, or something they die of old age and you can't produce new speakers quickly enough to take their place. It is not an official language of the United Kingdom or of the European Union. There is, however, now, as of 2005, um, with the Scottish Parliament, the new devolved parliament that they had since 1998, initiatives to promote the language with the ultimate aim of seeking official status within Scotland at the least. It was brought to Scotland from Ireland around the 4th, 5th centuries AD with the founding of the Kingdom of Dalriata. There were political tensions in the north of Ireland which caused a community of people to hop across the water to the other side and bringing their language and culture with them which then spread. It was pretty much confined to Argyll which is a little peninsula in the southwest of Scotland that sits down until about the 8th century at which point Gaelic speaking territory and the Pictish speaking territory, I mentioned before, kind of merged and became Gaelicized. The Picts adopted Gaelic language and culture. Gaelic spread until around the 11th century when it went into retreat due to, largely, King Malcolm III marrying Margaret of Wessex, who became St. Margaret, and she was thoroughly Anglo-Saxon, did not speak Gaelic, and Anglo-Saxon, Anglo-Norman became the language of the court at that point, and then the bourgeoisie and the aristocracy and Anglo-Norman mm -hmm. culture spread at the expense of Gaelic culture. Um, and what we now call Scots, which is a northern variety of Anglo-Saxon, sort of sister to English, had become the language of government and law by the middle of the 14th century. Gaelic was long suppressed, suffered from lack of use in the educational system. Uh, but now there are a number of Gaelic medium primary schools, at least in the areas where Gaelic is spoken. Uh, there is one secondary school, a high school in Glasgow, where a good 10 odd, 10 to 12 percent of all Gaelic speakers now reside. And there is a school in the Isle of Skye called Sol Morostek, which is the only institution of tertiary education in the world that teaches through the medium of Scottish Gaelic. They have a number of degrees and diplomas that you can study through the medium of Gaelic. And starting in 1773, running through the mid to late 19th century, um, waves of Scottish immigrants, many of them Gales, left Scotland or were forced out of Scotland, especially during the Highland Clearances, went to Canada, especially Nova Scotia, which is Latin for New Scotland. Many of them settled there. And in Cape Breton Island, off the north coast of Nova Scotia, there is still a community of Gaelic speakers descended from those original immigrants. Um, as I mentioned, there are today around 12 to 1300 Gaelic speakers still in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, of whom triple-digit figures, I don't, nobody knows exact numbers because they don't count it, are native. Probably a few hundred, several hundred people are native speakers there. And then there's Manx, my beloved Manx. Uh, Manx was brought to the Isle of Man. There's a little bitty island in between Britain and Ireland, sort of equidistant between Scotland, Wales, and Ireland. Um, brought there in, around the same time as it was to Scotland, 5th century AD. There's interesting, I don't have time to go into it again, obviously, but there's a, the Norse arrived in the Isle of Man, the Vikings, around the 8th century. And they developed a mixed Gaelic-Norse culture there, um, which is very, very interesting. Again, by the 1800s, Gaelic, which there they often call Manx, had died out as a uh, community language. It ended up being individual scattered speakers here and there were all that were left. The man generally regarded as the last native speaker of Manx, a man named Ned Madrill, died in 1974. However, as with Cornish, there was overlap. The Ncheshek, Gelgach, the Manx Language Society, was founded in 1899 that sparked the beginning of the Manx Revival Movement. So you had a couple of generations of people who learned Manx from the last native speakers while they were still alive, who then carried it on and taught other people. So there's never been a time when the language ceased to be spoken. But the method of transmission changed from parent child to student te uh, teacher student. And again, today there is actually a Manx medium primary school right across the street from Tinwald Hill, which is where the Manx Parliament meets. Um, and there are a few, a couple hundred children who have been raised, are continuing to be raised bilingually using both languages. How many have I done? I did Goidelic, Brythonic. I'll try to do this quickly and then let you guys go because I know I think I'm already over time. Um, Breton, I mentioned. I have to find my notes here. 
the second the Celtic language is the second largest number of speakers after Welsh, though as I mentioned the number is expected to decline drastically within the next couple of decades simply due to the age of the majority of speakers. Um, no official status whatsoever. The French government is very heavily centralized and French. French is the language of the French people, period. They struggle for any kind of recognition. There is a network of Breton medium primary schools called Diwan schools where they educate children through the medium of Breton although these receive no government funding. They struggle for money. They're all privately funded. The families scrape together the money for them. Um, Cornish, another language which I've studied quite a bit of. I really, really like it. It's very, very interesting. Um, somewhat closer to Breton than Welsh, but all three are pretty close. Um, attested starting in the ninth century. The bulk of traditional Cornish literature dates from 1200 to 1600, what they call the Middle Cornish period. There's a whole sequence of miracle plays designed to teach about the Bible and the saints' lives and things. And uh, these have come down to us, preserved in manuscripts, and they form the basis for the modern, revived Cornish language. Um, the so-called Act of Uniformity of 1549 enforced English as the language of the church for worship, and in which all Bibles would henceforth be printed and so on. And that kind of spelled the decline. That was the start of the decline of Cornish and Cornwall. Last native speakers died in the 18th century. But again, as I mentioned, this is when the sort of antiquarian interest in revival movement also began. No official status, but it is recognized officially as a minority language spoken in the United Kingdom. And it's recognized in the European Charter for Regional and Minority Languages. So they get some funding for the EU, from the EU, excuse me. There are some schools that offer courses. There's a Cornish language creche, what they call a creche there, which is like a daycare here, where parents can leave like small little children to be looked after, where they speak only Cornish. And there's an organization called the Cornish Language Partnership, which aims to promote the language. And if somebody wants you know, a bilingual sign, they provide the translations, that type of thing. And then, not to uh, leave it off, of course, everybody's here's favorite, I suppose, would be Welsh. <laughs> the, most thriving and vibrant of the six living Celtic languages. Around uh, over 500,000, 562 roughly thousand speakers in Wales, or 19% of the population, which is amazing compared to places like Scotland and the Isle of Man, where it's 1 to 2% of the population. But furthermore, um, an estimated, again not counted in the census, but estimates from scholars, 100,000 to 150,000 speakers in England. And uh, somewhere between, again, not counted in official censuses, so people guess, somewhere between 1 in 1,500 and 5,000 speakers in Chubut province in Argentina, where, like the Scots went to Nova Scotia and Canada, the Welsh emigrated to Patagonia. And there are still several thousand native Welsh speakers there. Um, well, long literary tradition, of course, for Welsh, starting in the 9th century. Um, the modern Welsh period is considered to begin with William Morgan's Bible translation of 1588. But just to look at the numbers a bit before we wind up, the 1911 census, beginning of the 20th century, 43.5% of the population spoke Welsh, now it's 19. Um, the Welsh also, as you likely know, have a devolved parliament called the Welsh Assembly. In 1993, they published, or published, they enacted a Welsh Language Act, which obliged all public sector organizations that provide service to the public to treat English and Welsh on an equal basis, meaning any Welsh speakers doing, having business with these organizations are supposed to be able to conduct all that business in Welsh, and they should publish any information in both languages. Um, Welsh speakers have the right to use Welsh in court proceedings. And they set up the Welsh Language Board, which is responsible for administering the act and seeing that people followed through and made good on it. Uh, this board was abolished in 2012 and replaced with the Welsh Language Commissioner. Basically, they had a bunch of people and they kind of said, you know what, one guy can do the job. <laughs> but so there's still a Welsh Language Commissioner who is responsible for overseeing the terms of this act and making sure that public bodies comply. Um, I will have to do it. I'm afraid it's 2.50. I think I've gone over a bit. I don't have a nice, tidy way to wrap it up. <laughs> Other than I hope that wasn't too boring, all the facts and figures. It's stuff that I find oh, really, really interesting. And I like to share. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
1901. Is Breton, oh, sorry. Is Breton spoken in Brittany? Or yes, in Brittany. Did I neglect to mention that very important fact? I'm so sorry. Yes, Brittany, the northwestern corner of France. If you look, they're kind of right below each other. You have Wales that sticks out, and then like a fat bit that sticks out. Cornwall right underneath it, a little skinny bit that sticks out. And then Brittany in the northwest of France sticks out right below that. There's these three kind of areas lined up where these languages are spoken, yeah. When you mention the last Cornish speaker and the last uh, Manx speaker, you mean that they were speakers that did not speak English, right? Um, not, not that they didn't speak English, but the, whose first language was Welsh and Cornish. Sorry, let me Jason, uh, did you want to I, Go ahead. Um, now, you know, was that in 1911 that was 43% of the population spoke Welsh? Yes, according to the census. And then it dwindled down, like as of today, it's 19%? Correct, as how, of the 2011 how, census. Is that due to the, due to the age population or the... Partially. Um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. The fact that English was the dominant culture. And like I said, there's a lot of intermarriage. A Welsh speaker might marry an English speaker, and then they don't speak Welsh at the house anymore. And the children speak English. And there's a lot of, within a couple of generations, the language gets lost. Um, this happened in Wales and Scotland and other places. Children were punished in school for speaking the language. Some of you may have heard of the Welsh knot. They had something very similar in Scotland. It was really insidious. They, um, I mean, this was in the days before people could begin to appreciate it. Going this is back. in my grandmother's day. Yeah. Um, so students who were caught speaking Welsh or Gaelic would have, in Scotland they had a, it was like a rope with kind of a piece of wood on it, assuming the Welsh knot was similar. Yeah. If anyone was, a child was caught speaking their native language instead of English, they got this hung around their neck. The only way they could get rid of it was to catch another child speaking the language and then they could pass it off. And whoever had it, at least in Scotland, I don't know if it were this way in Wales, at least in Scotland, whichever child had it around the neck at the end of the day got a beating. So they quite literally beat the language out of the children. You know, took, there were several generations who grew up ashamed to even admit to, you know, you hear maybe apocryphal, you hear stories of people who never knew that their neighbors spoke the same language because they always spoke English in public because they didn't want the other ones to know that they spoke Welsh or Gaelic or Breton or whatever it was. It was you know, made to, they were made to feel inferior about their own, the value of their own language and culture. And it's only within the last few decades and all over the British Isles that, you know, that this has lessened that people have begun to feel more pride in speaking it and setting up schools to teach it and so on. Yeah. Well, in all the public schools in Wales now, Welsh, you have to learn Welsh. And uh, like if I, you know, <coughs> call the bank in Wales, it's first they ask to be in Welsh, and then in English. Everywhere, really? Everywhere now, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, really? Yeah. 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 yeah there's a huge push mm. to bring Welsh back. And it makes the news. I still, I get, because I'm in these circles, I get news regularly of, you know, people now will put up a fight if they go to a bank or a post office, and the person that doesn't speak Welsh, they'll write letters and say, you need to get a Welsh speaker you know, so I can use my own language. And you know, 50 years ago, that maybe wouldn't have... Well, it wouldn't have been allowed. Yeah. Against right. the law. You know, but I say now they've got this Welsh... Well, the, the Welsh Language Act, and now the commissioner, whose job is to oversee and kind of enforce. It's actually in law now that they have to provide services to Welsh speakers. Well, also, uh, in Wales now, there are many... Uh, high schools, and certainly junior schools, where everything is taught yep. through the medium of the Welsh language. And I think in the past couple of years, uh, a Welsh university, everything is taught through the yeah, medium. I know you, um, the Celtic Studies program in Aberystwyth teaches mostly if not entirely through the medium of Welsh, which is mm -hmm. very, very Well, cool. that's where the Welsh Language Society yeah. was born. Yeah, that's <laughs> one place I know because I was, at one point when I was thinking about yeah. continuing on to do the Celtic PhD and so on, I actually looked at Abbott and I was like, wow, I'd have to learn Welsh first. <laughs> it was a requirement to, to get in and He's do it. Yeah. This is our token Welsh nationalist here from, <laughs> from when she was 16 that's years of age. Yeah. She carried the banner. <laughs> I'm totally fine with that. Come here, I'm bit. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you the Gauls. Yeah. The Gauls were from France, right? The Gauls? Yes, yeah. they lived in what is now okay. France. So the French word for Wales is Pays de Gaul, country of the Gauls. Yeah. So how did that come about? Um, um, that's really good. I assume because of the Celtic, the Celtic. The connection, with the, again, with the language. Okay, so, so the, the French 
decided that the, the, the country of Wales was inhabited by... Yeah, and I'll say the Gaul, or Gaul part, and the <coughs> whale, the well, W-A-L, well, well part of Wales yes. are, may well be etymologically connected. Oh, anyway. Gaul and Wales. Oh, and in fact, the wall yes. of Cornwall right. is the same as the wall of Wales as well. Yes. It was all, it was a, originally, I guess, a tribal name or an ethnic, mm -hmm. what they call an ethnonym of, of some mm -hmm. kind, yeah. Well, mm -hmm. Saxons called Wales Wallace, right? Wallace? Yeah. Wallace, yeah. Wallace, the Saxons oh. that invaded. Yeah. And interestingly, the Gaelic word for English is Sassanach, which Sassanach. is Saxon. 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 Very derogatory. Saxon. Yeah. 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 Well, but, 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 but in Scottish English, they're like, ah, bloody Sassanachs. But in, yeah. in Gaelic, it's Saxon. simply the word for English, period. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there is no other word, it's just Saxonach. 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 In England, Saxonach. the word for England is Sassan. Yeah. Right. Like Saxony, I suppose. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. 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 That's just that's the, the word, the name, yeah. yeah. Yes, sir. Uh, just a, a few I'll personal... I'll talk an Irishman. Yeah. <laughs> this is the old Irish guy you were talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you can speak. Let the Irishman speak. <laughs> anyway, yes, it's all true. <laughs> I was born in Belfast. In oh, it's a nice town. I like and, Belfast. Uh, not a nice town. It's a, tri <laughs> it's a tribal... Time. I enjoyed visiting, though. And I belong to one tribe, and there were other guys belong to the other tribe. <laughs> but that's another thing. I was born, I'm 84 years old. So what I have to say on a personal side of this is really re reflecting back to um, uh, the 1950s, uh, let's say. I was born in Belfast, and I was spent my first 25, 26 years there. In primary school, Irish was not taught as it is in the rest of Ireland, but it was an option. And uh, when we would go to school in the morning, the teacher would uh, take a roll call. And we didn't say present when your name was called out. We said Ansha, yeah. which is the Irish yeah. for yeah. present because that's the tribe I belong to. Later on, let's say about 1954, I was then in university in Belfast, Queen's University. And I suppose you would say in Wales, the national sport would be rugby. Uh, in Scotland, it would be golf. Or shouldn't he, depending on who you ask. <laughs> and in Ireland, it would be one of the Gaelic games, like hurling. Right. Hurling is a game which is played with ball and stick in a field the size of a bit, bit bigger than a soccer stadium. Uh, it's alive and well in Ireland. Yep. 82,000 people watched in Crokes yeah, Park it's, it's the All Ireland final in 2016. Scottish Shinty is very similar to the <coughs> Scottish yeah. Gaelic variant. Yeah. The equivalent in Scotland is Shinty, also a ball and stick game. In 1954, I'm guessing, that could be a year out, I belonged to one of the clubs that abound in every university, whether it be artistic or sport or whatever. So I belonged to the Hurling Club. I was a useless player, totally useless. Lies. <laughs> and, but it's all lies. Nevertheless, all of it, lies. <laughs> no, <laughs> nevertheless, we did play against the University of Edinburgh. Oh, yeah. They played shinty rules, we played hurling rules. <laughs> they were so very close that we played the first half one way and the other half the other way. <laughs> That's excellent. Yeah. And my memory of that visit to Edinburgh is this. They were very friendly people and we had a great big dinner afterwards and there were speeches. All of the speeches were in Gaelic. The Irish, uh, I, I didn't speak Gaelic, but the people in the Hurling Club, many of them did. And they all gave their speeches in Irish and the Scottish guys gave their speeches in Scots Gaelic 
and they tell me they understood each other perfectly. I didn't, of course, because I didn't speak the <laughs> And it really points out uh, really the closeness of the two uh, languages, if you can call them even separate. And also, when, when I would go on vacation from Belfast up the coast of Antrim to a little town called fishing village called Cushendall, I could go up on a hill and I could see Scotland on a clear day. Mm -hmm. So that's how close yeah, they well, were. There are parts where there's only 12 or 13 miles of water. Mm -hmm. So those are just, uh, a f you, there are many other reflections that I give you on awesome. uh, No, it's true. That, um, but uh, it's just I know, a connection between the I know Gaelic two speakers countries. in Scotland who have visited Ireland and been asked, what, what dialect of Irish is that? That they recognize it as Irish, but it's just different enough that they wanted to know which, you know, which Gael talk it came from because yeah, it wasn't yeah, theirs. They're like, yeah. no, from Scotland. Oh, and I've also heard stories. Again, I don't know if it's apocryphal or not. I've been told mm -hmm. about it because, in some parts, especially in Northern Ireland, it's mm -hmm. so my impression that this is a case that the Irish language is very heavily identified with Catholic faith. And I've heard story. Of course, the great majority of Gaelic speakers, not all of them, the majority in Scotland are Protestant, very strict Calvinist, Presbyterian Protestant. Mm -hmm. And I've heard stories of Protestants from Northern Ireland that went across to Scotland and broke down weeping because they didn't think it was possible to be both a Protestant and a Gaelic speaker. <laughs> <laughs> or so I've been told. Again, I didn't witness it, but it, it may be apocryphal, but it's, you know, it just, the closeness is there. There's definitely a shared common cultural heritage. Until the mid-1700s, there was a shared literary register of the Gaelic language that bards from both countries used. Yeah, it's really, really interesting. Well, what about the closeness with the other languages, like the Welsh or the Cornish? This is really interesting. Okay, um, I don't know all the reasons for this. This is why I'm still kind of still reading up on this stuff after all these years because it fascinates me. Um, so for Welsh, Cornish, and Breton, uh, Cornish and Breton are a bit closer to each other than either of them is to Welsh, but they're all very similar. What I have found just in my own studies, dabbling in all six languages, that um, grammatically, structurally, they're very close. If you look at the grammar of Welsh and the grammar of Scottish Gaelic, for example, they work very, very much along the same lines. 90, 95% of the words seem to be completely different. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how that evolved. I mean, you occasionally find a word that's similar, an obvious cognate. So many of the words seem so different, mm -hmm. but the sentence structure is so similar. Mm -hmm. So if you know one, it's easy to learn the other because you just have to learn a bunch of new words, but you already know how the language works, mm -hmm. basically. Uh, but I'm fascinated to, you know, still trying to learn more about how it evolved that way, yeah. And Manx is a little closer to Scottish Gaelic than it is to Irish, right? Yeah, the, I don't know how scholarly you want to get, the sort of canonical dating is that of a very famous scholar named Kenneth Jackson, who put it roughly at uh, what he called a Eastern Gaelic and Western Gaelic split, Eastern being um, Scottish and Irish and Western, uh, sorry, Scottish Gaelic and or Sc what became Scottish and Manx Western being Ireland at around 1300 AD, so it would be the Middle Gaelic period, followed by a further split between what became Scottish Gaelic and Manx Gaelic around 1500 AD. So Scottish and Manx are a bit closer to each other than either is to Irish, but they're all very, very, they all come from the same parent language. They're still very, very similar, all of them. I find like, I did my degree in Scottish Gaelic. I studied it, you know, intensively for four years as part of my course. And so, you know, having done that, speaking Scottish Gaelic well, I find I read Irish with little difficulty. The most difficult thing is there's a lot of different vocabulary. The grammar or sentence structure is 95% identical. I certainly can make it out. I just need a dictionary by my side to look up unfamiliar words. Listening to the spoken language, the pronunciation, the accent's quite different but it's certainly enough to follow the gist of what people are saying. The same thing with Manx. I found when I first started studying Manx, I went to the Isle of Man, stayed for a week, and really immersed myself in it. And I went back to Scotland, this was when I was at university in Aberdeen, tried to switch to Scottish Gaelic again. And when I first got to the Isle of Man, Scottish Gaelic would come out instead of Manx. By the time I got back to Scotland, Manx was coming out instead of Scottish Gaelic. They're that close. That, um, the thing about Manx is that they got separated from the Gaelic literary tradition. They became a very, you know, they lost that sort of literate bardic class completely. It became just a very rural, you know, island of fishermen and, you know, just kind of simple, hardworking people.